why Africa and why Nairobi is because uh, starting from 2011, I, I joined a small NGO, the, basically a group of architects. Uh, as a photographer, I work a lot with architects and uh, this group of, of young kids, uh, younger than me, because they are like 10 years younger than me, they wanted to, uh, to do, after a call actually from as uh, a teacher of a school inside the slum of Madare, uh, uh, the second slum of, of Nairobi. We are talking about a place of 600,000 people living in a very, uh, in a very dense uh, uh, urban area. After his call that he was looking for an NGO that was going to uh, build a school, um, I joined them and we went for the first time uh, in the summer of, of 2011. Starting from that experience, I start to document uh, Madare. I try to understand what what is a slum. I try to figure it out which way was the best way to uh, to document and to enter in that uh, so complex and rich environment. I not only. Uh, find out that Matare was complex, but the, but the city of Nairobi is an amazingly complex uh, uh, pattern of different situations where, uh, where the social, uh, the social uh, issues and the social class are really uh, are strongly different from each other. And um, I start to ask to myself, uh, which is the nature and why there's such a strong difference in the city? Uh, what I'm showing now is just a map of Nairobi. You have to imagine that um, till now the city is nearly four million and a half, uh, and uh, approximately in 10, 15 years it will be the double. That's what I what I read from the UN Habitat um, report. Um, but the very interesting point about the city is that at least three quarter right now three quarter of the population live in the, what are so, the, the so-called uh, informal areas, basically ghetto slums and iron sheet houses, or if it's not iron sheet, still a certain environment that is completely, um, uh, completely uh, poor, or let's say where the standard of life is very low. That's in another point of view. Maybe we will come back later on and look. Um, I just uh, want to show the map, bec not because I think, uh, because it's interesting in the fact that uh, Nairobi has a, has a certain structure that is not the typical structure of the city. It's like um, many different nucleus that they just stay close to each other, but it, and that mean, meaning with that uh, community that just live close to each other, but sometimes they communicate, sometimes not. Well, this because I think uh, uh, it's still a very segregated city. Now I'm showing uh, something that uh, is related to my own experience in, uh, in the slum, Madari, as you see. And I asked to my three guides to draw the map of the slum. And there were three completely different drawings. Uh, I asked them to explain in which, in every section of, of the slum, what was the, let's say, the characteristic and the kind of activity they can identify with that. So three different uh, situations, three different stories, three different approach. So uh, sometimes maps are very, are very subjective, even if we start from there as a sort of like a ritual and I wanted to go through it. But this is really the beginning of the story I'm, I'm going to tell you tonight. Madar Islam is, a, is an area that is divided in different parts. Um, there is a, a sort of like official geography and as well an informal geography. How the people, the local, they call the different areas with uh, very interesting names like, uh, for example, Kosovo, Gaza or uh, another called Nigeria, uh, depending which kind of uh, uh, things happened during the, in, the, in the recent history of the slum 
or the activity that is done in that section of, of the slum. For instance, this is the poorest part of Madare. Why is the poorest part of Madare? Because it's the iron sheets uh, area where people live in the iron sheets buildings, buildings, uh, I would say uh, houses or uh, shelters. Sometimes they become buildings because, uh, yeah, and I will show you later, some, because of the, of the characteristics that are absolutely similar to the formal city, when there is not space around you, they go on higher and they go for second and third floor. Right now, the school that have been started to be built in the 2011, the, uh, we raised the money the last, uh, the last winter and we are building the second floor because uh, there's more students and there's no space around. Um, I'm talking about the density of the place. I think it's very, I think it's very evident. And this is only one section. Let's say there are two areas because what is wrong when we talk about slum and we talk about poverty is just to give a very uh, simple uh, definition of it, like poor, that's all. No, it's a very dynamic society and uh, it's a very complex situation. It is not that poor people are arriving from the countryside they just find in the slum a place where they can buy, where they can build a house, uh, and uh, and that's on. No, uh, every piece of land in the slum, like Madare, as an owner somewhere, he rent the, the he rent the um, the land, and the person that or the family who go, goes there and live there can rent it, can build only in iron sheet, but he cannot use concrete on anything else because it's a temporary housing. And the idea of temporary housing is not just invented by somebody who wants to exploit another poor person. This, the beginning of, of this area, let's say even the legislation of this area, comes straight from the pre-colonial, colonial, from the colonial time. And the slums are a sort of like a drifting idea, drifting in the sense of like a, uh, yeah, that uncontrolled situation that comes from the fact that during the uh, colonialism in, uh, in Kenya, and also I, I heard in South Africa, the idea was that the city, let's say the urban, the urban area, was for the white people, and eventually also for the Indian, in the case of, in case of uh, Nairobi specifically, or Mombasa. Indian were sort of like a middle class or very um, specialized workers. They came to Kenya to build a railroad uh, that was linking um, Uganda to Mombasa. Uganda has a very important production of, uh, of um, many different materials and, and Mombasa was the most important harbor on the east coast of Africa, one of the most important. So this rail railway, the middle of this railway was the beginning of the city of Nairobi that basically was uh, burned because it was the, the a sort of like step over coming from Uganda going to the coast. Also, I guess the other reason is this uh, Nairobi is a high, is a sort of like a, a plane at a very, in a certain altitude and, and they resolve a lot of problems uh, like malaria and other kind of disease that you can uh, that uh, are a serious problem in Africa. So at that time they start to build the, this town, and the former city was for the whites. The whites were living there. Then there was a neighborhood where only the, the Indians could stay, uh, still a built neighborhood. Then there was a third part of the city, and this third part of the city was informal and temporary. Uh, the, the Africans or the black people, the locals, the Indians, as you want to call them, they were, uh, they could live there, especially when they have a job, or without job they could not stay, they were, they have, they were often forced to leave and go back to the countryside, and there, they could stay only for a certain amount of time. That, means in, that meaning they could build shelters, never a real house. After, after the, the colonial war, after the, the so-called movement of Mau Mau, uh, despite of every rhetorics, the problem is the same. Nothing has, has changed. 
also because there is a political reason and it's still open and it's why Kenya is so unstable as a country. Is it still not well decide who is the owner of the land after that, uh, the big, uh, the big uh, landowner left? And, uh, and it goes from uh, the micro situation like this slum to other bigger situation that go to uh, very violent political fights. I will not uh, explain picture by picture. I will stop here and there because uh, I want to explain certain situations. For example, it's also interesting of, of a place like Madare, and I'm starting from there because that's where I've been, uh, let's say, living in Nairobi, and I will go over it. So the, the work is still on, the, the work is not finished, uh, but definitely I've been working a lot on, on Matar Islam, and then I'm, I'm still working on the rest of the city. I keep uh, documenting Matare, and I'm just uh, discovering or uh, de documenting also the other side of the city. This is like, uh, this is a sort of like a open air movie theater organized by a local association, a local organization, which is very important in the social structure of, of a slum. Local organizations are mostly done by the young people. They are called the youth, like youth groups. So one of these youth groups is uh, specialized in media. And what they do, they make uh, little movies, very, uh, let's say, low budget movies uh, on the local, local communities. We have to think about Kenya as a country who has 41 different tribes. And this is, uh, has a lot of meaning. I don't know if you remember the clash of 2007, but often the tribal, tribalism is related to politics. This way of going and producing stories and narrations has, uh, for me, a very intense uh, meaning because, first of all, even if three quarters, or two quarters of the, or three quarters of of, uh, of Nairobi live in the slums, you will never see story of the slums unless crimes and and uh, and uh, other negative uh, um, negative news about the people of the slums. This is a way to give dignity because there are stories that they are they might be represented and spoken not only in Kiswahili, that is the national language, but also in the tribal languages. So it's just a way to, uh, for the people of the slum to see themselves and to see themselves represented, to see themselves projected. Like I would say this is a sort of uh, slum TV. And it is, because uh, that's the, actually the name of the youth group. It's called Slum TV. And they do documentary and they do uh, fictions out of the stories of the slums. Well, I just want to stop a second. It's one of, what, I, what I'm very surprised when I go around in Matari is how people are able to organize themselves. How are they able to, to make their own living out of uh, incredible ideas? Uh, these young kids, like many other, well, not so many, but uh, there are uh, many different like him, he just r literally rent a camel often from, uh, from the Somalians who live in Nairobi, there's a large community of Somalians, he goes around and for 10 cents, he offers, uh, let's say, a tour on the camel f to the children of the slum. And he, he, makes, uh, he, makes, uh, he makes a living out of it. Of course, it's not so much money, but it's also interesting. And I really like the situation of this camel ride in the middle of the, uh, such a concentrated and dense uh, urban surrounding. As I was saying, okay, this is the halfway. Sometimes, sometimes the owner get uh, bribing the police or bribing the government the right to build because I have to say, Kenya is a very corrupt place. Um, and so you start to see uh, second, third uh, floor. It's often, it's, uh, and it reminds me a bit of the south of, of the south of Italy. It's often the family that has every 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 floor is a different generation, basically, 
and, uh, and so on. Okay, there's a famous musician, Octopizzo. Um, I, I've been following several lines of my work, and one is uh, related to the, the scene of, uh, of like the, the, the music scene of, of the slums. And he's one of the most famous, and he's a very active person, very involved in two uh, pro problems, and, and, uh, and uh, helping the youth to find uh, a better way or not get into crime or to drugs. And this is the other section of the slum, is the, is the concrete slum. We always think about shelters and iron shit. No, there's a um, sort of like a slum, a middle class. And let's say, if I can reassume in a, in a short way how people arrive and where do they go? Normally they go in the area that we saw in the first picture when they really arrive. That's the arrival often from the countryside. The stories are many. It's not only, as is often said, the, the reason is not only the drown or the, uh, let's say, natural problem that uh, unfortunately African is suffering, but is often is economic and politic, uh, political, the reason why the families have to move. And they arrive in the slum, they go in the as a first when they don't have really resource, they go to live in the, in the cheapest place, which is the one that we saw before. And then when their situation change, this is the second step. It's still a slum. This is like a, still a dangerous place where nobody from West uh, Nairobi, let's say from the rich part, will ever come unless he knows somebody then can guide him around. And that's the way also I go around. I have two guides, two, now they're really my close friends there. They all the time help me, and uh, I cannot go by myself because uh, it's dangerous. And uh, what, how, this, uh, how this part of the, of the slum grow? What, where does it start from? It starts from the fact that the owners are often related to certain political party, and that's the way they get the votes. They give them the possibility to build they build these huge houses. There is an entire here that is uh, area that is done like this. It's still, uh, in, uh, from my point of view, um, I don't know. I've, I pose the question to the urbanists or the architects because this is a, uh, a border between formal and informal. Because for me, it's still somehow informal. It doesn't matter if the if the house is a building concrete, but the, somehow there's no other organization than the house itself. And there's no rule, and the, the, the sense of community and the space is really uh, similar to the other side. The, the cheapest house here is one room, no toilet, and one toilet for, per floor. Then, the, the one, let's say, going in a certain area, the situation changed, so we have one or two rooms and one toilet. And it's a big change. And we, we see it because even the density changed. We're still here in a situation where there's a, a concrete houses, but they are as dense as the, the other area. Once again, the other view. Okay, this, uh, often the activities are just spread along uh, the, the major roads of, of Matare. And this is a very sp specific place where they make uh, coffins. Okay, sorry, this was not supposed to be here. Uh, but we make a jump. This is a formal city, and this is the uh, uh, Indian temple. Uh, it's very important to talk about Nairobi and the Indians because Indians are extremely, I mean, there's a community that have, have been there since a long time. Uh, numerically, they are, they're, let's say, they are less, but they are still very, influential, they are the owners of the most important supermarkets and they are the owner of the most diffused newspaper in Kenya. And we are now at the edge of, of, of Madare, this is another area called Isili, is where the area where the Somalians live. It's already a different social uh, class because even if the Somalians arrive as refugees, 
This part of, 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 of Nairobi is already middle class, sometimes upper class, and the people of the slum, the Kenyans, go and work for the families of the Somalians. This is the landmark of Nairobi. It's the tower that represents the city, is the, the symbol, and it's uh, the Yomo Kenyatta Center. Uh, I think designed by the Norwegian architects, actually. No? We are here on the edge of what was the uh, Indian neighborhood. There are lots of markets and other commercial parts of Nairobi were related to to the activity on the Indians. They, as I was saying, Indians, let's say the middle class left, they went to maybe Canada as well, but the United States or Australia a lot, because uh, um, for two reasons, the instability, the economic instability of the country, and, uh, and also the fact that uh, Kenya is run from a very nationalist uh, form of politics, so they were a certain point, the middle class left, and only the riches remain in a sort of like uh, gated communities around the city. Uh, this is a guardian on a, on a part of the slum that is already, um, let's say, is still a slum, but become start to become a middle class slum. So, how we do? How we recognize that is uh, middle class? Of course, inside the house as a, as a toilet, but also guardians. All the cities, starting from the slum, has this idea that uh, the value of, the, of life starts from security. So even the slum has security people and guardians and, and so on. So it's already well diffused, and, uh, the idea of a gated community or a community that is controlled uh, by a certain, a certain security. And here I open just a chapter of, a, of, a, of my research that uh, has focused uh, on a certain way on the street sellers because I think that's the first step of the economy of the slum of a ghetto. I'm not only totally of the slum of the ghetto, I would say the entire city of Nairobi. It's the people that, let's say, they just organize their own life uh, day by day. And in this case, it's this man selling uh, stuff puppets uh, along the road. How these materials arrive? When you, you have to imagine all the charity coming from Oxfam, from uh, Salvation Army, and so on, these uh, containers arrive in the port of Mombasa. And at a certain point, point I arrive, they arrive to Kikomba a huge market, open-air market of Nairobi. And then they enter into the economy of the city in this way. Somebody bought, a, uh, let's say, a quantity of materials, could be this, could be uh, trousers, could be everything, and they call it matumba, that means the clothing of the deaf, or like some, something that is to, uh, of the dead, because they don't see the people and they see that the, 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 the clothing are used. And then they, they start to sell. It's a sort of like a day-by-day -day economy. And the idea of, of uh, really focusing on this category is because at a certain point there was a very interesting article of, uh, of um, The Economist, the British uh, magazine, economic magazine, talking about the economy of the slums and the fact that there's a lot of money in the slums, which is true, but I also want to give a face to this idea. And this, uh, this face are these people. It's just easy to say, you know, talking about uh, a quantity of money and so on, but we should really try to understand the stories and try to get close to them. So they will, there are others and they are just spread in the, in the slideshow. This is the ghetto when it rains. It's really a huge disaster. Just a day of rain is block everything and everything can become a, um, an, an immense quantity of mud. Uh, this was a story I've been following on, on still working on the youth of the slum. Uh, this guy was uh, 
a thief and then he was actually he was killed and I went to his funeral but I, I'm not showing all the story right now I just keep this as a as a portrait and uh, and also of course uh, a ghetto is not only p people trying to make their own living in in an honest way there's a problem of criminality and I want I try to get into it and try to understand who is the people who are doing it and so this is Teddy, and it's, uh, now it's not there anymore. This is Georgine, and she, she's also another of the stories I've been following about youth. She's a young mother. And uh, now she's living in this house with other women because uh, actually she comes from the poorest part of, of Madare, but uh, it's really unhealthy for the child. Uh, the, the father is not there. She doesn't know where, where the father is. And uh, she managed to live in one of the concrete houses, sharing the house with other women. And this is a view of Matare. Still, the topic is the economy of the slum, but uh, I want to explain why it's related to economy, what is the, what is the point. There are three sections. The, the concrete houses are along the road, one of the most important roads in the area. So they have a major value. And the poor live in the, in the areas. But the poorest live close to this part where you see those fires. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the projector cannot show in a perfect way, but what are these fires? These fires are illegal distillery. One of the income of the slum comes from uh, uh, liquor, illegally brew called chana. It's a liquor that uh, is uh, done traditionally uh, in the culture of the Kikuyu, which are one, is uh, the biggest uh, tribe, most important tribe of Kenya, because they are the, numerically the most important ones. Um, and um, basically many families live out of, this, of the production of this uh, uh, liquor, which is completely legal because it's also dangerous. The way it's made it, especially in this situation, is dangerous and can kill the people who drink it. Because in order to make a, a, a bigger production uh, in a short uh, in a shorter amount of time, they uh, put some. Uh, uh, chemical ingredients that they, uh, if they are not well balanced, besides the fact that they, they are poisoning in the body, but if they are not well balanced, they can either make you blind or they can kill you right after. This is Nairobi today, uh, especially in a certain section where there was the countryside is now a, a sort of like a leopard skin where the city start, uh, restart uh, and grow. Uh, what is interesting for me in this image is you see there's a sort of, of a field and the slum started from the other side, there's a railroad and the slum is just, it's a small slum that is slowly growing and coming toward the city. Let's say I'm more central, this is the, the, the outskirt but it's slowly growing, reaching the area of Madara Slam, which is just nearby, or the other section, on, let's say on my left, of the railroad. This is a group of dancers that were going one day uh, for a dancing, how do, you, how do you say, a competition in the center. And this bar was just at the edge of the slum, it's, uh, and I find it incredible because uh, I don't know, but that's probably here, in somewhere in Canada, the, the wall behind them. Another of the street seller. What you see on the side is, uh, I work normally making a sort of like home book and writing down a uh, short interview. I ask them uh, the age how much do they make per day and how many children do they have? This old man has 13 children and that's what he sells. And then this is for me one of the most interesting. Before the British, 
Mada uh, sorry, Nairobi was uh, a Maasai land. So the Maasai are the owners of, the, or like their, the city or the area of Matare belongs to them. This is a young guy that does a typical job done in the, uh, from the Maasai in the slum. The other one is to sell the shoes, and then you see those shoes uh, done up. They are done out of tires. Or what he's doing is selling medicine, traditional medicine. And he goes in, in the jacket, he has little other uh, uh, bottles. And the little jar, plastic jar, has this uh, red uh, um, liquor that uh, helps to, to resolve many diseases from fever to typhoid fever to malaria. And I don't know, I never tried, but uh, people in the slum use it. Or I'm glad that I have this image because this is the cliche of, of Kenya. When you come out from in the airport, you see pictures of Maasai everywhere. Of course, they have on their backs the Maasai Mara. But uh, uh, I found a strong the fact that they are still there and they keep their own identity, their own way of dressing, uh, despite the, all the other groups and tribes, they kind of uh, lost and hide their own traditional identity. And this is exactly the situation I was talking before. This is the distillery. The liquid is boiled, and then a certain it goes. It, when it's, um, um, how do you say, uh, when it's gas, the, it gets froze by the running water. Uh, Matare is, um, is a slum that, um, it's a valley, basically. There's a very narrow river passing in between. And the river is very important for those who make the illegal distillery. And sometimes they really fight. There's a, like a very violent fight to get this spot along the river, because that's a bad spot to produce chana, because the, the most important part, which is the, let's say, the cooling of, of the gas becoming liquid, let's say, when the liquid become liquid, Done with the running water means that you don't spend money out of electricity. Electricity is very expensive in Kenya, and uh, often the family of the slum, they get illegal connection to electricity, and they, but most of them, they don't have any, any access to electricity. And that brings another big problem, which is, uh, which is the fire, because they use little lamps with the flame, and there's lots of problems with fires. But also, in this situation, it's important to be along the river so the families that produce chana, they fight to each other because this is the, the, the very important spot for it. Another series I've been doing are the water tank, like the, this one that you see, because I, was, I wanted to, to find out which kind of impact. This, let's say this structure is all over the slum, all over the slums of Kenya, not only Matare, there's also the famous Kibira, this structure is a cube, uh, let's say, uh, I, uh, sorry, a concrete cube and a plastic water tank on top. And uh, the space below is, the per, is for the person who has the concession to sell the water. The water is very expensive. And uh, let's say uh, the government doesn't provide the running water, of course, in the slum because it's not official and people cannot pay. So uh, basically, this is the last uh, step of the arrival of the water. But in the meantime, those, uh, let's say, cubes, when it, wherever they are, they become something else. They create a sort of like a little squares, a little environment where people uh, just stay around. It makes me think about little piazzas because, uh, squares, I'm, I'm using the Italian word, uh, uh, little squares, because the slum, the way it's uh, built and organized, doesn't have really a uh, wide space, unless there was a fire, unless there was a, a clash during 2007, every little space is used. But under, around these uh, cubes, they, it's, it's, the situation is a little bit different. So I make a series of pictures. There are uh, like 70 different uh, water tanks. I'm not showing all of them, but few of them. It makes me thinks about the use of the, of the space or this idea of self-organized public space and so on.
And okay, it's a, another part of the economy is the, the work uh, done by the women. They are often street sellers, but they don't go around. They are not nomadic. They normally have the little store or the little uh, spot where they sell mostly food. There's one part where the Luo, which are another tribe coming from the Lake Victoria, Bo, are very, uh, they are a lot living in Madar Islam. They used to be the second group, but unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, apparently, because of the problem with HIV, they went down to fourth of the, uh, let's say, in terms of population. Of, of, uh, of the tribes of Kenya. But, it's, but I, I insist to say that they are important because uh, among the Luo, they are very important politicians and also um, political and, this, and, and uh, very important, uh, let's say, leaders that, that uh, brought uh, the independence in, the, in Kenya. Uh, so uh, Luo's, Living in, they live in, in sorry, in uh, Lake Victoria, which is eight hours of travel from, from Nairobi. And there's one specific day that there's a, this uh, bus that get completely full of stuff. People go back or bring back uh, goods that, can, that cannot be found in the, in the countryside. It's a sort of like a, a weekly rituality that I've been seeing a lot of times and I came out with this picture. As I was saying, without space and uh, the growing family, so slowly there's like second and third floor. So even the slum goes raise up as uh, as every other city. Let's say. Some of the houses, concrete houses, they have uh, advertising, and the reason is because on the the level of the road is the right one to capture the Coca-Cola. The road is running, let's say, behind me, and is uh, as a sort of like a set. The house becomes a sort of like a set to advertise the Coca-Cola uh, for those who drive the cars. So this is the concrete houses. Makes me think about uh, Naples or some southern part of the world. And then here we enter into the, in the center. Okay, this is a, let's say, last view of Madar Islam. Okay, now we enter in, this is the center, the commercial part of Nairobi. It's a completely different situation and environment. Built best, mostly by Westerners. Uh, lots of them, they are uh, related to NGOs or like to government, like uh, especially North Europeans have been doing a lot uh, in the post-colonial uh, time. They build uh, lots of important buildings in Nairobi. Even I think the structure was done by them. And uh, I also include this uh, portrait of this man that is uh, a, gate, a gated community uh, guardian and uh, very significant the resident welfare for those who are scared of, of, of uh, being robbed and, and uh, to have thief entering their own villas. That's the other section of, of, of Nairobi. We have to divide Nairobi into different environment, east and west, with the different that west has very rich areas, with a, but also has uh, this other slum called Kibira that you might have a heard because it's very famous. It has more than one million of people living inside. And uh, this is the business area, business district of Nairobi. The building in the middle is the uh, EU headquarters in East Africa. Uh, there are Parts on, on this other, let's say, uh, section of my research, they are missing. I, for example, I couldn't take any picture of the American embassy, which is in very big, but I didn't have any permission. And also the other part that is missing, because I'm starting to do now a series of the official buildings of Nairobi, is the UN, also because I couldn't find yet the uh, permission to do it. But UN is very important, it's basically 
one of the most important income of Nairobi because those uh, who are called the expert, they are really, uh, there are people who really makes a big difference in the economy of the city and they are pushing a lot the uh, construction of the, of the real estate because uh, uh, normally they have a good salary and they can pay and, and this is the way that the economy of, of Nairobi is also moving on. These pictures are done like one year and a half ago. There's another chapter, is the, the Chinese who are building the roads of Nairobi. As you know, Chinese are very influential now in, in Africa. They are, their engineering is changing completely uh, the face of the cities and also it's cha it will change and, uh, and will have a really strong impact into the economy of Africa. So this is a road that is coming from the center and uh, we reach many different areas of Nairobi, the poorest part of Nairobi. But right now it's under construction, so people are using it as a, as a work site. Let me see, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> and the center has a very important mosque and skyscraper and other kind of like modern buildings. Suspicious Chinese is looking at me because I'm taking pictures of the him and a group of workers behind him. And this is, let's say, the typical real estate, the, the gate and the houses, or like apartments. This man is really a little story that I want to, I, I just, at a certain point, I, I found this guy walking on the street, he was carrying the, the house, and it reminds me of certain paintings where there's uh, the scent that is as the, 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 not the house, but the, or the building or, or the city that is protecting, you know, certain ancient paintings. It was somehow similar in a certain way. Then I asked him what, it, what was this, and uh, he told me that he was working for uh, a construction company, and that was a real model. And, sorry, I just come out. And then he showed me all the measurement of that house that he was carrying around. And here are the kind of houses they build. This is like the outskirts of Nairobi. Uh, new villas are growing. Like, this is a sort of like typology. Uh, this is like uh, the step that, uh, that middle class that come out from the slum and when they, they save enough money, they, be, they buy a piece of land. We are really at the edge of the city here. And they start to build houses like this. Or like this. Is, um, this is the section of, of the Indian home away from home. It's probably like uh, sort of like a residence for uh, not not rich people. So they rent a house for those who work in the in the, in the city during the week, and then they go home at, uh, for the weekends. Well, I still don't know what is a helicopter of Christ ministry, but there's a church for sure, and it's in the center of Nairobi. Once again, the tower of the Yomo Kenyatta Center and the tower of Kenyatta Tower. And part of the city where there are like 60s and 70s buildings. And they, the big market of Kikomba, which is a big, huge area where you can buy everything, basically. 
And here you see the real estate expanding. Uh, we are now at the edge of a slum. A small slum is not Madari, it's a different part. It's called Kangemi. And uh, they just brought a piece of land and, this, and they, they, they build a condominium condo with like uh, two, two rooms uh, or three rooms. And they immediately start to protect themselves from the slum that is behind. So you see the electricity in every kind of uh, way of protecting from the eventual attack of the poor people trying to get in and robbing inside. We are back in Madare. This is um, a movie, a movie theater. It's called Video. There's a video screen, and there's one voice who translates everybody in, uh, in Swahili. So it's a movie. It's like, uh, let's say, black market movie, not, not legal. So there's one voice that uh, translates everybody, and uh, kids, they pay a few shillings, and they watch a movie. It's a barack done for that. It's called the Video. Yeah, we are in, again in the center of Nairobi. And a very beautiful, this is like a parking lot that become uh, every Sunday a skate, a place for skaters. <clears throat> for me it's interesting because this could be everywhere. This could be here, that could be in Milan, could be in any other kind of city. <coughs> the fact that there are such a <coughs> strong different standard of life in one side is a uh, real poor incredibly poor situation then somehow a relaxing situation like this one is very interesting is <coughs> sorry give me the idea you honestly give me the idea also with those with all this uh, problems of security and, and uh, gated community give me the idea of, uh, of a city that is still segregated. It started as a segregated city and even with the independency, at, at the end of the day is not so changed. It's a social segregation because before it was a racial segregation. <clears throat> Again, gated community along the main uh, highway built by the Chinese. I think this is uh, more or less the same as everywhere. There's an important highway or important subway line, and then the city grows around. <coughs> Traffic jam. One of my guides, his name is Adigo. He used to live in the slum, but recently found a job in town, and now he lives in a middle-class area called Reisam. <coughs> and he doesn't really want to know anything anymore about the slum. But he has been the one that explained me everything about it. I'm showing this picture because you might know, you might, you might remember last September there was a very terrible attack done by the, <coughs> sorry, Somalian terrorist called Shebab. And it was done where there's a white building behind. This is called Westland. It's one of the richest parts of Nairobi. <coughs> and uh, well, that's the way it looks like. And it's once again Westland, business, uh, let's say uh, office, uh, office buildings along the major road that across the area. Same situation under construction. <coughs> uh, let's say middle class um, gated communities, small houses, two floors. Walls and, and uh, gardens at the entrance. This is uh, probably one of the richest parts of Nairobi. It's called Karen. 
And actually, Karen Blixen used to have his her own house here, and then we saw it after this image. I don't think there's any relation between Karen and Karen Blixen in terms of name, but this is the area because of the hill of Karens. They are like uh, here around, and this. Um, <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> this is the house of Cla Karen Blixen. And then this is Nairobi, one of the highway built by the Chinese. That look could be Los Angeles or could be Guangzhou or Beijing. Another example of middle class, or let's say, uh, growing like a uh, new rich or middle middle rich. I don't know how to explain. <coughs> Little villa, self-organized, and uh, lots of protections. And these are the views from from the skyscraper that I mentioned before, the landmark of Nairobi. Uhuru Kenyatta is the son of, uh, of the father of, of Kenya, Yomo Kenyatta, is the actual president. I would like to say that the family Kenyatta right now has, is the owner of more than 50% of the land of Kenya. <clears throat> and an interesting story talking about the Indians. This man is definitely Indian, Muslim Indian, but uh, since three generations Kenyan. So what he's holding in his hand is uh, very proudly, is a portrait of Yomo Kenyatta. He saved this uh, souvenir of the revolution and he wanted absolutely to be portrait with it in his hand. He lived in the houses, they used to be houses for low income class uh, built by the British, and they are going to be raised down to give space to new condos. You know, like speculation is uh, advancing. This is a, an area called Pangani that has been in one side invaded by Madare. Used to be middle class, now it's more Islam. And uh, it's also close to the center, so in the other side there are like two, two waves. One is the Islam with the poor people and the migration to the city. In the other side they are like uh, real estate uh, rich Kenyans, they want to build condos and push away the poor people. Okay, that's an example, like these condos have all this, let's say this uh, uh, urban, uh, I would call it urban language, like the, the, the <clears throat> this way of, of protecting and using ropes and, and electricity, I think it's, it's part of the visual language of the city. Uh, it's uh, Nairobi, but it's a lot of the, it's the same in South Africa. In every, in every part where the problem of security is uh, probably the most, uh, the strongest part of, 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 the, of the impact of, 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 the, of the urbanization. This is still Isili, uh, and uh, it was after another attack of Al Shabab, where was bombed one of uh, one one let's say public transportation, and lots of people died. I was wondering if there was a reason for the difference in light. Uh, it seems like all the pictures that you take outside in the slums. Yeah. are very exposed to light, as if, I don't know if you had a statement in that. Are uh, uh, very exposed? Huh? The extreme exposure to light okay. when you're, when you're uh, like showing reality outside in opposition to the portraits. You mean they are uh, slightly overexposed? Yeah. Is like it like a, a decision? Is it like a, is is a technical it a, question? Yeah, it, okay. well, uh, also All if right. it's a decision to, to okay. do it, it like that, like to show reality mm -hmm. in a more blunt way. Um, yeah, it's just my, my way to, to work, I guess. Also, the pictures of, of Palladio are slightly overexposed. I think I can get a certain kind of, of colors out of the overexposure. And beside this is also that uh, 
certain situation, if they get too dark or too dense in color, they give a completely different feeling. And I wanted to stay more uh, as neutral as possible in this situation that is uh, so dramatic by itself. So uh, it's, if I could explain in why I'm using that technique, is, this is my answer. Any other question? Yeah? Wait, wait, wait. Wait, 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 so we can hear you. Thanks. Um, is uh, water uh, supply uh, problematic in Nairobi, or is it fairly plentiful? Um, is the water, sorry? Water supply for the city of Kenya and for the uh, I mean, uh, looking at the, the kind of water tanks that are there in the slums, it looks like it, and its expense must mean that it's quite rare there. But is that because it's being sequestered in richer parts of the city, or is water in general uh, scarce, or bound to be, bound to be okay. scarce? Uh, it's an interesting question, because there's a joke that say that one liter of water in the rich neighborhood is cheaper than a liter of water in the slum. And why is like that? Okay, the slum people, especially, okay, those who live in the shelter, ha shelter houses, the, um, sorry, the iron sheet shelters, they don't have running water for sure. There are like some uh, public toilets, not so many is a huge issue. Has a lots of organization they are supposed to build, they build it, sometimes they just run out with the money. I mean, all the story of corruption is there and uh, it's really, it's really a, a, a bad story beside the, all the rhetorics about helping in, in a situation like that. But why is costing more? Because this, the government arrived to a certain point. The government arrived to serve with the water at the edge of the slum. Then there are like three or four steps that makes the water even more expensive. Why? Because uh, either you, can, you go but there's already somebody who's selling the water for the government. And of course, he makes some money because it's, it's his own job. So it's the over-privatization of things that doesn't, doesn't really work. The problem of Kenya is that if you, if you get sick, you, get, you have to go, you go to the hospital and you have to pay. It's like to be in, you know, in, in a country like the United States, but you're in a third world country. I really don't know what the, what's, what's the reason of it. I mean, I would really ask to some a big organization. So the first step, the water is sold. Then uh, if the, the family has the possibility, they, they go and buy the, on these uh, water tanks, uh, uh, cubes, the water. But if they cannot, for any reason, there's somebody who buy the water, so the second step, and goes and is uh, one of the jobs of the street seller. It used to be often one of the jobs of the women in the slum. They, there's a, uh, there are all women who stay around the, the water tanks, and they wait for somebody asking for, can you bring six liters of water to my house? And more or less ask uh, to women, it's like between six and 12 liters, depending on how many children do they have per day, or per day or per two days. So imagine this system. If, if you cannot do it because you have to carry it, maybe that day you have a pain or you have something, so you have to pay somebody to bring you the water, and it definitely is more expensive that uh, compared to uh, somebody who has to full uh, swimming pool in the, in the other side of Nairobi. So this is the situation. Thank you for asking this. This is a really important point. Hi, thanks so much for your talk. I have actually just a small question. Maybe I missed it. But when you were showing us the picture of the fellow with the model of a house, was he an, um, an architect? Why, why did he have the house? Who was he? It was somebody, it was just uh, somebody who was making his own living, making uh, cardboard models. It was not an architect. He was working, not, the architect is not, this is architecture without architects. It's a, let's say, a small construction uh, company. You know, those who build the houses are not really in a proper way. You've seen a lot of it. No? They, there's no architects involved in many of these constructions. There's a construction company, which is different. That, Hire somebody to uh, following the, the, the let's say the, the measurement. He built uh, a cardboard house with more or less uh, is similar 
to the house that was going to be built. So it's just somebody who, who produced uh, cardboard houses. Nothing more, nothing less. He's not an architect. So was he advertising it or on his way somewhere? He was or? just walking from a place to another. Okay. Then I saw him. It was because he was just walking carrying the, the house like this. It was okay. so beautiful. I mean, it, it was a vision, absolutely a vision. As I was saying, it reminds me, that you, uh, it reminds me of certain uh, paintings, uh, of like ancient paintings uh, where the sand who protect the city is represented holding a building or a, uh, uh, holding a model of a building or a model of a city. It reminds me of this, and I, I thought it was fantastic, and I, I absolutely want to portray him. Was he curious about who you were? Sorry? Was he curious about who you were and why you were taking a photo of him? I don't understand. That. I, I'm sorry, I'm a bit deaf. <laughs> I'm wondering picture. if he wanted to know why. You were taking no, a picture. Uh, the first thing for him was Musungu, uh, that means white. Uh, can you buy the house? Well, you want to buy the house? <laughs> and of course, when he sell the house, because that's, that's uh, I mean, the, seeing me so interested on this, I, I it was, wanted to sell the house, and actually I bought it. I gave it to a child that is a friend of a friend, and I say, when I'm leaving, I will be inside, and he still, and the, my friend told me for a long time, was saying that, Oh, Filippo is inside there, look. <laughs> so I just create something that, that I, I, I bought it because I like it, but I couldn't really uh, bring you with me to, to, to Italy. I wish, but it would be crushed by the, uh, you know, in the baggage and so on. And there's another guy that you don't see here that make the same job, but uh, it's made out of um, glass. He make the same kind of things, but out of glass. Very beautiful, but uh, okay, it's not here. I didn't want to show too many things, but actually, I have shown too much. But uh, it's just to give the idea what it's like going around in Nairobi. It's also, you know, okay, it's a dangerous place and so on, but it's also very beautiful and uh, astonishing to walk in the city. And every, every corner, there is a surprise. There's a, su such an intense life beside all the problems that are there. And one of these is disappearances of people coming with incredible things like carrying a, a very fragile, because it's also fragile, in a very rushy uh, environment. But he was able to carry it, so it was really something. Yeah. Hi. I just want to say, like, thank you for your time. And Grazie. you almost answered my question, like, uh, how you went? in Nairobi, what, what, what is the, the bond that you have with this city? Why do you choose this place? Um, okay, that also this is a good question. I have to tell you, the first uh, day I enter in Madare, I say, no, I don't want to do anything here, it's too much. Then I met the guide, and slowly I start to discover the life, and uh, I thought it was interesting to to be the way I was, a, wh a white man going in an African environment and to see all their reactions. I have to say people are mostly friendly. They, they even appreciate a lot that I try to make a docu documentary on their uh, social situation. They really understand that. It's also helped the fact that I am also working for this NGO that is building a school. This give another kind of uh, idea of myself going around and taking pictures. But there's another point. This man that I photograph, I all the time, when I can, when it's not really impossible, try to give the, a picture back to the people. This is a way that, as, as much as I can do it, not, I cannot do it for 100%, but let's say, for example, or the street seller, they have, they have all the pictures. Or other categories, all, all I go to town, and after three or four days, or I drop it somewhere, they know they can find it. Or for example, the Masai always pass through a bar where I also go, and I drop it there, the picture. Because you know, the, the very interesting thing is when you get some, when you know somebody in, in the ghetto, or you know somebody probably in Africa, or in Kenya, the first thing he does when, you, when he invites you to his own house, is giving you his own album and showing the picture since he was a child. It's such an amazing ritual that I wanted to be in that album. Not because I want to be uh, as a photographer, but I really want to give something on that album because it makes me really emotional, it makes me think that photography is really a lot. 
not because of the values, but for somebody who has a, a strong connection with it, I wanted to, um, it has uh, something that I share with him. I mean, it's also for me, photography means a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. So uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I, I wanted to, you've sort of, you're, you're good at ask, at answering the questions just before people are about to ask them. So I'm going to um, ask one that you might have sort of answered. Uh, but I just, I just finished working on a project with uh, children in Kibera and uh, five or six other slum areas where we actually asked them to draw, map, and take photographs of where they felt safe and uh, not so safe. And this was actually part of a project with Rooftops Canada, which is a, yeah. you probably know about them. Uh, so it was very interesting. And they, I mean, in some ways, their photographs look, look very similar to yours in terms of where, uh, particularly around issues of water and environmental issues and the danger around toilets and so on. And um, what we've tried to do is, is kind of feed their photographs and, and maps and drawings back to the community to sort of say, well, what could you do to make this safer for children? Because it's clearly mm -hmm. a very dangerous area. So I guess I'm interested in what would you like to, in your bigger pro or in your project? What you have expressed your view about the beauty and the excitement of the city and the diversity and so on. What would you like to come out of your work in relation to the uh, s the the slum areas themselves? Do you have? an agenda that you would like to take forward or are taking forward or uh, mm -hmm. that you would describe? Okay. Um, the idea is to come out with uh, at least a book and uh, possibly an exhibition. Oh, there was already some exhibitions done with my NGO. I didn't show, for example, the school and the children of the school. The, the other part of the work I do. But I don't want to do something only about the slum, because I think it's much stronger to show Nairobi and to see that the heart of Nairobi somehow are the slums, which uh, uh, unbalance completely certain ideas that certain areas of Nairobi has about Nairobi. I want to unbalance this geography. I started from there because I want to crash as a system, not because I can really crash it, but let's say in my little, in my little experience, and uh, invert the vision of Nairobi, beside the officiality and everything. What is missing for, for now is really to talk about the other side. I start to work on it, but it was, it's really complicated. And just to tell you, I've been arrested like a few weeks ago because I was just taking pictures of, the, of a building, very modern building, in the wrong side of the city, where everybody who's taking pictures of a building is uh, supposed to be a terrorist, because that's Westland, that's the richest part of the city, and where all the security is. But if somebody get lynched, and I, I, I had a picture of somebody killed and lynched, I, took, I, 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 I wanted to show and I decided to take it out because it was too much, like few, few, half an hour before coming here. And the police doesn't care about it, but they care about uh, a white man that is taking pictures of a modern building because he's a terrorist, and it took me to the to to the to the to the station, and they start to say a lot of uh, lies in order to scare me and to get money out of me. I want to go straight on that direction. Uh, we need to. I think we need to talk about the rich in Nairobi to explain what is a contemporary African town. I want to tell something about contemporary Africa, and not only me. I want that. I want to start because I want one of my friends to keep doing it, okay? I just bring my culture, my ideas, but I want, I would like an, an African guy will keep working on this project. So it, this is my goal. And the way I can do it is making book because photography is about book, like good photography and exhibitions. <laughs>